over the Great Lakes. All right, well, we'll get things started. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Erin Rowan. I want to welcome you to our Audubon Great Lakes MI Birds webinar on piping plovers in partnership with National Audubon, Detroit Zoo, and the National Park Service. Uh, thanks for spending the next hour with us. We're really hoping this webinar will be helpful because we know people are spending more time outside and continuing to connect with nature close to home. And despite the snow outside, a spring is around the corner and there are gonna be opportunities to get outside and explore. Uh, the physical and mental health benefits of experiencing nature are so important for all of us and Audubon and MI Birds are committed to making the outdoors safe and welcoming for everyone. I'm the Senior Conservation Associate for Audubon Great Lakes. And I manage the MI Birds program, which is an outreach and engagement program presented by Michigan DNR's Wildlife Division and Audubon Great Lakes. Audubon Great Lakes is a regional office of National Audubon, and we work across the five Great Lakes states through conservation, policy, advocacy, and engagement, where we have over 200,000 active members, over 50 chapters, and two nature centers. Our regional office is based outside of Chicago or in Chicago. I will be your facilitator today with the help of Emily Osborne, our senior communications manager, who will be monitoring the chat box and will help to facilitate the Q&A session at the end of the program. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This presentation is being recorded. All participants are going to be muted for the duration of the webinar. Please take a moment to locate the participant and chat function on the Zoom platform to actively participate in the webinar. If you want to send any questions or comments to the facilitator or presenters, please use the chat box. If you're participating, excuse me, via Facebook Live, uh, you can submit your questions or comments in the comment section. We will be monitoring the chat box and comment sections on Facebook Live throughout this webinar, um, so please be respectful. We'll be reviewing the questions you've submitted in the chat box during the Q&A session uh, at the end of the presentation. So all of your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Today, we're gonna to be chatting about all things Great Lakes piping plovers. Uh, we're gonna learn about their life history, conservation status and threats, recovery efforts and research across the Great Lakes, captive rearing and releasing, and what we can do to help. And today I'm joined by guest speakers, Vince Cavalieri, wildlife biologist at Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore with the National Park Service, Sarah Saunders, quantitative ecologist with National Audubon Society, who works closely with the Audubon Great Lakes Office, and Bonnie Van Dam, the curator of birds at Detroit Zoo. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Vince, uh, who's going to introduce us to the adorable piping clover. Vince? Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, good afternoon or morning, uh, depending on your uh, time zone. I saw that there's a, quite a variety of uh, locations represented today. Yeah, so I'm just going to get us uh, started off with a little bit of uh, uh, natural history of the piping plover, the Great Lakes population in particular, and then I'm going to start uh, introducing uh, a little bit about the birds endangered status, endangered species act, and, and uh, start on, on our road to recovery for this species. So here we have a, a couple of pictures of adult piping plovers in breeding plumage. Next slide. So there you heard uh, the, the uh, call of the piping plover. Piping plovers are very vocal, which is why they're called piping plovers. Uh, and in fact, their scientific name is Caradrius melodis uh, because they're noted for their kind of melodic, uh, cheerful uh, piping song um, or call, which is uh, often described as peeplo. So that's a, you hear that kind of peeplo, peeplo, uh, is, uh, rings 
well across the beaches where they occur. Uh, so right now you're looking at an adult piping plover in breeding plumage and non-breeding plumage. And if you look down at the bands on the bird's legs, you can see this is actually the same bird um, on, the wheat, on the breeding grounds here at Sleeping Bear Dunes, where I'm located right now. And, the winter, and this bird wintered at Bulls Island uh, in South Carolina. Um, and in fact, for some of you that have been following the piping plover uh, story for some time or read uh, Audubon magazine or, or um, uh, online, this is actually the famous old man plover, who was the oldest uh, piping, Great Lakes piping plover ever recorded. He lived to be 16 years old. But anyway, uh, just thinking about the identification of piping plovers, uh, you can see here that the birds are, are fairly compact, have kind of a round look to them, uh, but otherwise have the typical plover shorebird look. Um, large head, large eyes, uh, relatively short bill for a, a shorebird, which is common in plovers, uh, but that really kind of large block headed look with the big eye um, is, is a great way to, you know, tell that you're looking at a plover as opposed to a sandpiper uh, right away. In breeding plumage, piping plovers get this uh, nice neck band. So they have a, a, a neck band all the way across. They have a forehead band that goes in between the eyes and they get an orange and black bicolored bill. In the non-breeding season, uh, they lose the black forehead band, they lose the black neck band and their bill turns all black. Uh, but in all plumages, uh, perhaps the best way to identify piping plovers as compared with other plovers is how pale they are. Uh, they're noted to be the color of dry sand. Um, so especially like the kind of nice white sand beaches you'd see down in Alabama or South Carolina, uh, the birds match really well with that. All right, next slide. So here you see some similar species or species that sometimes people confuse with piping plovers. Uh, the closest one here in the Great Lakes region that you'd see would be the uh, semi-palmated plover, which you see at the top left. They also have a single neck band and a single black forehead band. Uh, but as you can see, this is a much darker looking bird. Uh, they have kind of an all black mask as opposed to the very kind of pale face you see in piping plovers. And on the bottom left, this is actually a photo I took in uh, Louisiana of a semi palmated plover and a piping plover side by side on a mud flat. And you can really see that kind of more pale look in the piping plover, even though they're relatively uh, similar sizes and shapes. Uh, in the middle, of course, we have the ubiquitous killdeer. Um, this is a bigger bird than a piping plover. They have two neck bands instead of one. Uh, instead of being the nice kind of pale, dry color of sand of a piping plover, this is a more brown, like mud to kind of almost cinnamony uh, brown looking bird. Um, and of course, they have a much different call, the, the, the killdeer, killdeer call. But even so, um, I get an often killed there reported to me as piping plovers just because they're uh, the one plover that people are very familiar with. I just see I just see a question where someone said palminated plover. It's palmated, uh, semi-palmated, and it's because they have a slight webbing between their, their toes. So that's the palmate foot. Um, a couple other species or, or groups of species that occasionally get confused with the piping plover. On the top right, uh, these are Western sandpipers, but any of the small uh, peep sandpipers, especially in, in non-breeding plumage, when they also become very pale, uh, can sometimes be confused with piping plovers. But you can see these birds have a much longer bill. They don't have that kind of short stub bill. They have long bills. Um, and they're, they're a different shape. They don't have as big of a head. They have much smaller eyes. Uh, uh, plovers feed uh, by uh, 
uh, visual means more so than, than tactile. So they stop, look with their big eyes where they see very well uh, and try to catch things by sight. Whereas a lot of the sandpipers use their long bills to probe down into the, the mud or the sand to, to catch prey. Uh, another kind of ubiquitous shorebird here in the Great Lakes region is the spotted sandpiper, which you know looks a fair different in this photo from a piping plover, but from a distance uh, on Great Lakes shorelines, sometimes people will confuse the two. Uh, spotted sandpipers, long sandpiper bill, a more elongate look compared to the very compact, almost compact almost round piping plover. And they're noted for, for doing this kind of dipping move continuously um, where they kind of bend their, their, their knees slash ankles here over and over again, uh, which is a good field mark for spotted sandpipers. Next slide. So, so the, uh, there are actually three separate uh, populations of piping plovers uh, that are all managed separately uh, by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other agencies. So on the eastern seaboard, you have the Atlantic Coast population, which breeds all the way up from Newfoundland in Canada, uh, along wide Atlantic Coast beaches, all the way down to kind of central North Carolina. Uh, this is actually a separate subspecies from the ones uh, you find here in the Great Lakes. The, there, are, there are the palest of the, of the piping plovers, and often their neck band does not meet in the middle. So there'll be a gap of white, um, which is unlike our birds here in the Great Lakes that almost always have a continuous neck band and are usually darker overall than the Atlantic coast birds. The birds on the Atlantic coast are listed as threatened by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as opposed to endangered. They're still in trouble, uh, but there's about 2,000 pairs of, of them. Similarly, the Great Plains population, which breeds on uh, big river sandbars and, and prairie potholes in uh, the upper Great Plains region of the U.S. and, and Prairie Canada, also is listed as threatened. And they, they number also about 2,000 pairs. Here, the, the smallest of the three populations is the Great Lakes population, which, as we'll see, numbers about 70 to 75 pairs uh, and is much more critically endangered than the other two. All three populations winter in kind of a shared wintering range in uh, this purple area that you can see down here. Uh, they all like uh, wide kind of inlet beaches. So inlets where like uh, water breaks through barrier islands or on the coastline and the birds uh, forage on tidal flats. So where the tide comes in and out uh, in those areas. The three population, uh, any bird from any of the three populations could show up anywhere in this range. But they do have tendencies to go to certain areas. For example, a large percentage of the Atlantic coast population goes to the Bahamas and the Caribbean. A large percentage of the Great Plains population goes to Texas, Louisiana, and northern Mexico. And a large percentage of the Great Lakes population goes to coastal South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Next slide. So this is just a, a photo showing locations where we knew there were Great Lakes birds breeding uh, between 2015 and 2017, and also where they were seen in the non-breeding season. Uh, so you can see that a large percentage of the Great Lakes population goes to South, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida with smaller numbers in other parts of the range. And there's actually very few that go to that west, far western part of the range and only a handful seen out in the Bahamas. Next slide. So winter ecology, we're in winter now, I'll start with that. So the birds, uh, as mentioned, go down to these spots, especially South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, where they can be found on wide beaches like this. This is actually in South Carolina uh, at a place called Harbor Island. 
And here the birds switch their kind of between foraging on mud flats uh, when the tide is out and then resting on upper parts of the beaches when the tide's in. And that's what you're seeing here in the picture on the right. So they blend in really well with this uh, substrate. So there's actually about 30 piping plovers in the picture on the right. Uh, in, in both pictures actually, but the right's blown up and they're kind of just resting amongst the, uh, the rack that we call it, which is these kind of the seaweed and other things washed up on the, on the beach um, when the tide comes in. Next slide. Here we see some pictures of what the, of the birds on the wintering grounds. Uh, the ones on the left are, are birds out foraging on a mud, mud flat. The, these photos are from Louisiana. And then some pictures on the right are birds uh, kind of resting up on the uh, higher parts of the beach when the tide comes in. Next slide. Uh, so once winter is kind of coming to a close, as we're, we're getting closer to here, uh, the birds will begin their spring migration. So uh, this for Great Lakes piping plovers begins in March. Um, as the birds start um, moving around on the wintering ground, some of the birds like from the Bahamas, for instance, will start moving uh, to mainland Florida or the Carolinas uh, as they move forward. And then they continue their, uh, their migration into April and even May. Next slide. Uh, so they arrive here in the Great Lakes uh, starting in April. And that's kind of when they begin, begin their summer ecology and summer season. So when they're arriving back here in the Great Lakes, they're looking generally for wide sandy beaches, uh, far from a tree line uh, that have lots of cobble. So this is this kind of large gravel that you're seeing in this photo here. This is a, a photo from here on North Manitou Island at Sleeping Bear Dunes, which is one of their preferred nesting spots. And it's really important for them to, to get a wide beach well away from a tree line, uh, which, which helps protect them from predators and is their uh, preferred nesting habitat. Continue. So as mentioned, they arrive, start arriving in April. The first, uh, earliest one we've ever seen here in Michigan is April 5th. That was uh, down at uh, Ludington State Park, for those of you familiar with Michigan. Uh, and the first one we've ever had here at Sleeping Bear Dunes was April 7th. Uh, so starting then in, in early to mid-April, they start coming in. And usually by mid-May, the bulk of all the birds have, have returned. Next slide. So as the birds arrive, the males almost immediately start setting up nesting territories. Uh, they do this by a variety of uh, displays. They do a flight display where they, they fly very deliberately with uh, big wing beats, um, kind of in like kind of, uh, you know, patterns around their nesting beach and they call continuously while they do this. And this would be an, like an advertising call to, to other piping plovers that they're setting up this territory. Then the females arrive typically a, a short time later. Uh, there's a number of uh, other courtships display, displays that they do together. Um, which eventually needs, leads to pairing and then nesting. Uh, so you get egg laying typically in, in May into June, and they almost uh, always lay four eggs, occasionally three, very rarely five, uh, but over 90% of the time they lay four eggs and they lay them right out on the beach. So in this slide, you can see uh, some, a picture of an empty nest cup on the bottom right. And you can see they often fill them up with little uh, pebbles or shells. Uh, and then they lay the eggs in like a depression in the sand and that becomes their nest. And then on the bottom left, you see a bird incubating the eggs on a, one of these cobble patches on the beach that they like to nest in. Next slide. Uh, in June and July, you see uh, chick rearing. So the eggs hatch out and the Adults uh, take care of the chicks. Both the male and female are involved in this. Um, the birds require, the chicks, I should say, require their parents for about a month after they first hatch. 
uh, until they're able to fly on their own. And during this time, uh, they actually feed um, themselves. The chicks feed themselves right from birth, but they need the adults both to brood them, to keep them warm. That's when you see the, the chicks like go underneath the adult and the adults kind of uh, cuddle around them to keep them warm and also to protect them from predators. Continue. This is a, a nice picture of a adult piping plover brooding uh, some chicks. Uh, and then we get fall migration. Fall migration in piping plovers is, is very protracted. So you'll actually see some birds leave the Great Lakes as early as July, uh, but then others that don't leave till August or even into September. And I have this question mark to December on this slide because we don't exactly know when the birds settle down in their final spot uh, in the winter. Some, because sometimes they like, they get to a spot as early as July or August, they stay there for a month or two, uh, and then uh, they'll move to somewhere else. And then they'll stay in that spot, like say in December until they leave. Oh, I just saw somebody who asked what the piping plovers eat, which I should have mentioned before. Uh, they, they almost entirely eat uh, invertebrates. So this can be insects, um, heavily insects on the breeding grounds here in the Great Lakes. And then on the wintering grounds on the tidal flats, they eat a lot of um, marine worms and uh, mollusks and things like that. Next slide. Uh, so historically, there were piping plovers all across the Great Lakes, uh, as many as three to 400 pairs, uh, maybe even five or 600. It's not quite known, but uh, we know they were widespread. We know they uh, occurred at basically every sandy beach habitat across the Great Lakes. Uh, as you can see, all these plovers here are, are places that piping plovers were documented to have nested uh, historically. This is kind of like pre-1900. Uh, there were even, you know, like in, in some surprising places, like Waukegan Beach near north of Chicago had 30 to 35 pairs. Uh, there were places in, the, in Indiana where we knew there were like large numbers of pairs like that. Uh, Long Point in Ontario, some people think there was as many as 100 pairs there. And uh, by the late 1980s, next there were, uh, the piping plover was nearly extirpated from the Great Lakes. There were uh, literally like 12 to 20 pairs at this point. Uh, they almost disappeared and they were completely uh, down to a handful of sites in, in Northern Michigan, including Sleeping Bear Dunes out on North Manitou Island, uh, Grand Marais and uh, Whitefish Point up in the UP and uh, a few other, um, Great Lakes Islands like Beaver Island and, and uh, the tip, kind of the very tip of the mid of the Lower Peninsula. So what happened? How did we go from four or 500 pairs to, to 12? Uh, a bunch of things. But the biggest one is shoreline development and habitat loss. So I mentioned, you know, like around Chicago, there were a lot of plovers. Obviously, they lost a lot of those beaches. Same thing in Ohio, same thing in Ontario, same thing in Pennsylvania. Uh, you just saw a lot of wide scale habitat loss, either to industrialization or building up, you know, cottages and second homes and things like that. Next slide. And not only did they lose uh, these, hab these habitats to like direct development, but also recreation pressure. So the few beaches that remained wild or wild looking, uh, you got you know, large numbers of people coming in and, and kind of taking over the beach, unfortunately. Um, fortunately for those people who like to use the beach, but not for the plovers. Uh, there was also a big increase in predator numbers. This includes gulls, crows, other things in that all ate the plovers. Next slide. But then, uh, you know, so the birds are down to 12 pairs. What do we do? So they got listed as endangered in 1986. A big group of people came together to help take care of them. Um, you can see all the people on this slide. So we have federal partners, state partners, 
uh, nonprofit partners like uh, Audubon Society putting this on today, um, Great Lakes tribes, uh, lots of other folks coming together to, to help the plovers. Next slide. And so when a bird becomes, or when any animal becomes endangered in the US and is put on the endangered species list, uh, they're supposed to get a uh, recovery plan. So what the recovery plan is, uh, is a document put together by Fish and Wildlife Service that is almost like a cookbook on how to get the birds back off the endangered species list. And part of that, next slide, is to come up with recovery criteria. And so these are things that need to be met before the bird, the animal, in this case a bird, can be taken off the endangered species list. And perhaps the biggest one of these for Great Lakes piping plovers is this number, 150 breeding pairs for five consecutive years, 100 of these in Michigan, and 50 in the other Great Lakes states. And, and we also include in Ontario in this. Uh, the sec a second recovery goal is we actually want to see an average of 1.5 to 2 fledglings per pair for five years. Uh, and 10-year projections indicate the populations will be st stable. So this is based off of research that was done that showed that we needed to have this 1.5 number to, to keep the population stable or growing. Next slide. So how are we doing on this? Uh, so the bottom uh, yellow uh, line is the number of pairs. And you can see from this low in, in, the early, in the 80s under 20, we gradually built up uh, to 70 pairs in 2009, dropped down a little bit, uh, and then went up to an all-time high of 76 pairs in 2017. Since then, we've bounced around a bit. We've had these high Great Lakes water levels. Uh, that don't do our birds any favors because it reduces habitat and, and causes some other problems. But last year we actually had 74 pairs, so near an all-time record high for this population since listing. And then the top line is the number of chicks. So you can see that bounces around a lot, but last year we you know, were up in this near record high territory of uh, over 120 chicks fledged. Next one. And uh, this is the chicks fledge per pair line. So we remember we're shooting for 1.5. Uh, the bottom line is wild chicks only. And in last year we were up in the 1.6 to 1.7 range. So we were meeting our recovery goal. Uh, the red line includes captive reared chicks, which, which Bonnie from Detroit Zoo is gonna talk about in more detail shortly. Next slide. And of course, uh, maybe the coolest thing is seeing the birds grow again. So, you know, I showed that slide where they were just in that little area of northern Michigan. Well, the birds have spread out again back to Wisconsin, uh, Ontario, uh, New York, Pennsylvania. And of course, uh, a bunch of you who are on the line, I'm sure know about Monty and Rose in Chicago and Nellie and Nish in Ohio. So in the last couple of years, we've gotten... Um, more nesting in Illinois now with Monty and Rose and last year for the first time and I'm sure there's people on here who remember the like, exact number I think it's 83 or something like that uh, years since they have nested in Ohio and they returned again last year so that was super cool news. I think that might be it for me. Oh that's a good picture of multi-recovery uh, the multi-partner recovery program lots of volunteers uh, and uh, landowners and interns and other folks as well be beyond our professional partners. Great, thanks Vince. I will pass things over to Sarah Saunders. Thanks Aaron, thanks Vince. Um, so I'm Sarah Saunders, I'm a research scientist with the National Audubon Society, as Aaron mentioned, and um, I studied piping plovers, Great Lakes piping plovers for my PhD, and I've been involved with their recovery uh, for over 10 years. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about what our recovery efforts entail, as well as talk a little bit about research. Next slide. So there are five critical components to recovery efforts for piping plovers, beach closures, 
public outreach, nest protection, captive rearing, and annual banding. And I'll give you a little bit more detail on each one of these uh, now. So beach closures are one of our main efforts uh, on the ground. We close off areas where we find nests with psychological fencing and roping and signage to indicate to beachgoers and passerby that this is a nesting area for an endangered bird and to give them space. It's really important to close off these areas because birds are incubating for about a month. And if you get too close to those nests, you bump those incubating birds off the nest and then that could cause um, their eggs to not be able to hatch. And so we wanna make sure we give them plenty of space. And then we also cover their nest with explosions, which is this wire cage that's shown here. And this really protects the eggs from predators as well as beachgoers and dogs. And those explosions have fencing that allows the adult birds to go in and out easily and incubate the nest. And both the males and females incubate. And so it allows them to do their nest exchanges so that they can both incubate, but then it protects it from um, avian predators as well as mammals. And when we started using exclosures in the Great Lakes region, it increased hatching success by over 80%. So it's a really critical component to recovery. Next slide. Monitoring is also essential for daily protection. So Vince showed you a map of where we have plovers currently nesting in the Great Lakes. And so that's a lot of locations, which is really great news for them, which means we also need to have people staffing those locations and keeping an eye on the birds. So during the incubation period that I mentioned, it's about a month long. We have people going out and checking the nests daily to make sure both parents are present and in incubating the nest. And then when the chicks hatch, we have people going out and counting the chicks every day to see how many chicks are there. Uh, as Vince mentioned, they lay four eggs. Typically those four eggs hatch. And so um, we need to have people keeping an eye on the chicks since they can run around and feed themselves within hours of hatching. And so monitors are really essential for that for those efforts. And so these are just some pictures from some training sessions uh, where Vince is located at Sleeping Bird Dunes. They do a training session in the beginning of the season during spring every year that uh, teaches people the type of data that we like to see collected um, from monitors across the Great Lakes so that we can synthesize all of that information together at the end of the year uh, to learn how we can keep adapting our uh, monitoring procedures over time. Next slide. Public outreach is also important. So you can imagine that a lot of the beaches where plovers are nesting are really popular for people as well. And so this is um, an opportunity for us to engage with, with those beach goers and educate them about piping plovers and why they're endangered and what we should do to protect them, as well as to be able to just identify plovers. Sometimes people have been going to the same beaches for many years in a row and they had no idea that plovers were nesting at that location. So being able to show them a piping clover through the spotting scope for chicks is really an important um, part of the education component of recovery. So we have information kiosks at several sites along the Great Lakes. Uh, Whitefish Point, for example, has um, a really great interpretive sign. Um, we have volunteers at a lot of locations. So in addition to having monitors going out there and actually um, checking on the birds and reporting data, we have people um, who are volunteering to go and talk with beach goers and recreationists to let them know that the plovers are on the beach. We have brochures and videos that we hand out, um, as well as have our Great Lakes Piping Clover Recovery Effort Facebook page um, and other social media. And we're going to uh, touch on a little bit of an engagement program that we're starting in Traverse City uh, later on in the presentation. Captive rearing is a major part of our recovery efforts as well. And Bonnie is gonna talk about that in more detail, but I wanted to mention it here uh, because it is focused at the University of Michigan Biological Station, if anybody on the call is familiar. It's located in Pelston, Michigan. It's about 20 minutes from the Mackinac Bridge. So it's centrally located within the Great Lakes population. So if we have eggs that need to come in from um, the far western edge of the breeding range to the far eastern edge of the breeding range, it's pretty centrally located, which is really helpful. And so what do we, what eggs do we bring in for captive rearing? Well, if one of the parents of a nest goes missing and um, has been identified as missing for more than several hours, we'll pull those eggs and bring them to the biological station for captive rearing because the one remaining adult 
can no longer feed themselves and incubate the nest. As I mentioned, both the males and females take turns incubating. So if one of them goes missing, they can't both take care of themselves and the nest. So we don't want those eggs to not hatch. So we bring them in to the biological station and we hatch them there. We raise those chicks until they're over 30 days old. And then we release them at beaches where um, other wild chicks are present so that they can migrate together at the end of the season. Um, so these pictures show some of the um, facilities at the bio station, such as the pen that we have on Douglas Lake um, that gives them exposure to a shoreline environment and teaches them um, how to feed themselves. And so they're ready to go when we release them. And then Bonnie, I'll, I'll give you a lot more details in a little bit. Next slide. And then last but not least is annual banding. And so this is one of the efforts that I was heavily involved in during um, my PhD when I was studying these birds. And so we banned all adults and chicks in the population each year. And so over 98% of the Great Lakes population is marked with bands. So if you see a piping plover with an orange flag or an orange band, that means it is a Great Lakes bird. There's the other populations that Vince mentions, they also do banding but they won't have um, an orange flag. So if you see an orange flag bird somewhere on the wintering grounds, you know it, come, it came from the Great Lakes. So to ban the adults, um, that's the picture shown at the top left there, we use what's called a potter trap. And so we put the trap over the nest, we replace the real eggs with some fake eggs. Um, and so the, the eggs don't get damaged during the banding process. So we put the trap over the fake eggs, set the trap, and then the bird walks into the trap because they're very motivated to incubate. And so then we pull the bird from the trap and we put some uh, lug bands on, which include plastic colored lug bands with unique combinations. So we can individually identify the birds as well as an aluminum band, which is um, a standard band. Um, and that combination stays on that bird for its entire life, so we can uniquely identify it. And the whole process of banding an adult uh, doesn't take more than five minutes once we have them in hand, and then we release them and replace their, the fake eggs with the real eggs, and that process is done. The chick banding portion is a little bit more challenging just because the chicks are able to get up and run around within hours of hatching, and so it's up to us to be able to uh, catch those chicks and ban them um, and then release them. And the cool thing about the chick bands is that um, all of the siblings within the same brood get the same combination. And so you can identify them by broods, but they don't get unique combinations unless they come back to the Great Lakes as an adult and um, nest. So during that first year, then we'll trap them and give them a unique combination simply because we don't have enough combinations to be able to give them a unique one at hatching. Um, so the chick banding process is um, a little more complicated, but it's fun to watch. On the next slide, I think we have time for the video clip of um, me last year at Montrose Beach, where Monty and Rose are nesting. For those who are fans of Monty and Rose, we did chick banding there last year. And so here's a quick clip from that. And then we release them back to Monty and Rose, who were there the whole time peeping at us and letting us know they want their chicks back. And they were happily released, and now they're back with their parents. So it was a pretty smooth process and a beautiful day for it. About 10 minutes total in the hand and maybe 20 minutes total to do the banding. So we had a lot of help with the volunteer monitors that are here from dawn to dusk every day. And they were able to take a look at the banding process. and. Um, now we're headed back to, to ban some more chicks elsewhere in the Great Lakes. Great, thanks, Erin. <laughs> so yes, that was the chick banding process, uh, Monty and Rose's chicks last year. So um, yeah, it's a fun time to be able to involve volunteers in that so they can see the birds up close. And then just a quick run through of some research highlights. Uh, there's been a lot of research on the Great Lakes birds over the years, and I obviously can't cover all of it now, but I would encourage you to check out uh, Dr. Francie Cuthbert at University of Minnesota has done a lot of this research as well as her grad students. Um, so please Google her name and find out some more information from research. But here are a few highlights from recent years. So on the left here, I'm showing 
um, one of some results from our scientific studies, and then on the right, what that meant in terms of how we improved the management and conservation for the population. So in one study, for example, we demonstrated that early hatching chicks are more likely to survive their first year. So that told us it was really important to be able to get monitors out there on the ground really early in the season so that we can locate those early season nests and protect them with the exclosures to ensure that they hatch since those chicks are more likely to survive their first year. Uh, we found that body condition prior to fledging influences uh, their whole first year survival. And so that told us that Yes, it's really great to focus on protecting and closing off those nesting areas, but it's also important to be able to identify where chicks are really heavily feeding so we can close off those areas and move that kind of signage and the roped off areas to the feeding areas as well to make sure that they get uh, enough insects, enough invertebrates to really build up their body condition. We found that adult survival is negatively influenced by merlin abundance. Merlins are um, basically, they're number one avian predator in the Great Lakes region, and we found there was this really strong negative relationship with their adult survival. So that told us we needed to improve methods to reduce Merlin-induced mortality in the Great Lakes region. Next slide. We also did a study where we wanted to figure out why we were seeing more adult males breeding in the Great Lakes population than females. So to do this, we pulled feathers during the banding process when we were banding chicks because we needed to sex the chicks um, to see if more male chicks were potentially surviving to fledge than female chicks. And you can't identify just by looking at a piping clover chick, whether it's a male or a female. So we had to pull feathers in order to sex them at that stage. Um, and we found that female chick mortality did contribute to a male biased adult sex ratio. So um, more female chicks were not making it to fledging, which is about 23 to 25 days old. And so it told us we needed to increase the monitoring specifically within the 10 to 23 day old window in order to identify causes of chick mortality. And we also tried to look at, at to see whether that lower female chick survival was related to hatching date with potentially more females hatching later in the season when they're less likely to survive or whether female chicks laid less, weighed less at banding indicating that they had potentially poorer body condition than male chicks. And we found that neither one of those was the case. Um, so it's important that we continue to sex checks to identify any changes in the adult sex ratio over time. And we have been doing that and we've discovered that the adult sex ratio um, with more ma breeding males seems to change every year. And so some years we have more males hanging around and some years we don't. So um, it's really, it's important to can you continue long-term monitoring um, of the sex ratio over time. Next slide. So research and banding has told us a lot. And like I said, I couldn't cover everything, but here's a, another, a summary of some more information that we've learned. We learned about the breeding separation of the three populations because we're banding um, over 98% of the population, the Great Lakes population is marked. We can identify if a Great Lakes bird shows up at either the Atlantic Coast population or the Great Plains. And that is a very rare occurrence. So it's told us that we have pretty strong breeding separation. Banding has told us about longevity. Uh, I think I saw in the chat, somebody was asking how long do plovers typically live and on average they live about five to seven years and as Vince mentioned our oldest living plover is six was 16 years old so it obviously varies but on average it's about five to seven years old um, it told us about mate and site fidelity I saw a lot of questions related um, to do they keep the same mate over time and uh, banding has told us that they do tend to return to mate with the same individuals. If both of those birds show back up at the same site, then they tend to, to nest together again. Um, but it's not always the case. Sometimes the timing is off and they'll find another, another mate in a given year. Uh, but for the most part, they do have pretty strong mate and site fidelity as well. So they tend to return to the same breeding locations again and again. Um, we've been doing some genetic testing, and so it's, uh, we've learned a lot about genetic diversity of the population and also wintering locations and migration routes. And so this bot the bottom images there are showing us just from banding, we can um, calculate so far what the fastest um, migration speed has been in the population. And so this is an individual that was photographed 
at Sleeping Bear Dunes um, on July 22nd in 2013 in the morning and then photographed that same bird again at Crandon Beach State Park near Miami uh, just two days later on July 24th. And so with that, if we assume that the bird is photographed right before leaving and right upon arriving on um, the southward migration, that's 44 and a half hours difference. So it had to have been about 31 miles per hour that uh, she migrated. So pretty impressive that we can get that information just because we have birds uniquely marked with bands. Next slide. So that was just a snapshot really quick of the recovery efforts and the research that's been gone, ongoing in this population. I encourage you to reach out to me um, if you have other additional questions or visit their website um, to learn a lot more about Clover stories. So now I will hand it over to Bonnie Van Dam, who's going to tell us about the captive rearing efforts. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us in our webinar. This is, um, as Sarah had previously shared, a picture of the facility at the University of Michigan's biological station. And this is where, for several years, we've been operating incubation and hand rearing. Um, oh, again, here's another picture of the foraging pen along the lake shore. Um, it's been, the program has been a little bit different the last two years just because of the pandemic. Um, I'll explain that. Next slide, please. So several zoos have been assisting with this program uh, for, for several years. The Detroit Zoo has been facilitating and coordinating the program for the last 21 years. And what we do is we reach out to our um, colleagues um, from other zoos that have very experienced bird keepers and the expertise with artificial incubation and hand rearing. And we schedule them to come to the biological station and stay during um, between the dates of May and August, and they help with all of the rearing that takes place. Unfortunately, in 2020, um, when we should have been planning um, all of our uh, partners' travel dates to get to the station, COVID hit. And it was, it was clear that we were not gonna be able to function out of the biological station, and people were not gonna be able to travel. So we kind of had to scurry together at the last minute and come up with plan B. And what we did is we decided to do the artificial incubation and partial chick rearing at the Detroit Zoo. And um, we did that again last year and we probably will do it again next year. Next slide, please. Uh, Sarah mentioned Dr. Francie Cuthbert. She's just one of our many multiple partners She's with the University of Minnesota, and she has been monitoring um, piping clovers since 1985. And in 92, she received permission to recover abandoned eggs and captive rear with the hopes of releasing the young and contribute to the wild population numbers. And in 2000, uh, the Fish and Wildlife determined that uh, this was successful and that it was needed, and it was determined that um, it would become part of the recovery effort. So around that time, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service asked if reached out to AZA institutions to see if we could provide assistance. Next, please. So there's a protocol that all of the field monitors and people out in the field use when they're determining an abandonment uh, and their strict criteria. We don't get involved with the eggs until uh, abandonment has been declared and has been discussed. But there's several reasons why they be, can be abandoned um, and it can be covered by sand, it can be um, no parents for a couple hours, or maybe a male is off making another nest scrape um, with a different female. Um, what we do is at that time, it's determined we pull the eggs, they're collected, they're labeled, and they're placed in uh, an instrument that looks like this red cooler which is basically a portable incubator. It allows us to keep the eggs warm um, so that we can transfer them to their destination and put them in yet another warm incubator. Next, please. There's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, we, we only get involved with the paperwork when it becomes an abandonment and we receive eggs. 
But from the time that we do have eggs in our possession, they are labeled and followed through as they progress through all their life stages until reuse. Next, please. This is a picture of our incubation room, and this is at the University of Michigan's biological station. Um, again, the last two years, this has been taking place at the Detroit Zoo. Um, I want to point out that it looks easy when birds incubate eggs because it's uh, kind of like they just lay them and you just sit on them. When we become involved and humans are doing artificial incubation, it's a little bit more difficult and it's, it doesn't appear to be as easy as the parents do. So we have, we have to follow the eggs, we have to weigh them, um, we can use special equipment and candle them and, and see their progression of development. Um, the incubation period, just like the wild um, uh, chicks is 29 days plus or minus a few days. And it is important that we see uh, eggs lose weight from start to finish. And then we know that the embryo is developing accurately. And if a weight is, or an egg is gaining weight, we start to get a little worried. Um, hatching can take up to four days. You have to be really patient, um, but that's the time that it takes for them to um, hatch. Next, please. Again, um, we have special forms that we use uh, for each egg. Each egg has a form and we take the data, which just comes from weighing the eggs every day and we can plot it and follow it and make sure that we have a trend that makes us um, feel comfortable that this egg is gonna make it to a full term and have no problems hatching. So we have some fancy equipment. Um, some zoos use egg buddies, um, the bottom lower, um, picture to the left is a picture of a candler, which is a unit that essentially lets us look into the egg and determine fertility. And then to the right bottom, um, there's an actual embryo in this egg and you can, I put three dots in this picture, but you can see the eye and then the um, ear and then the lower dot is the heart. So in cases like this, we can actually see the eye and the opening for the Years, and then we can see the heart beating. Next, please. So we follow a, a protocol that we have that guides us every step of the way. So we have a lot of information that we share, make sure all of our staff is understanding their expectations and what they need to do. So um, it helps with setting up the building and it follows uh, all of the eggs through chick rearing and release. Next, please. These are just some cute pictures. Um, the one on the left is a newly hatched chick. And it appears that he has uh, three other clutch mates that are still hatching. Um, in the top center, that is a freshly hatched piping clover chick that you can still see is a little bit um, wet. And so the first couple hours after they hatch, they like to be sat on, they like to be kept warm and they dry up. This is where it's really important that we provide the right heat for them because they don't have a parent. We also will provide tiny stuffed animals or feather dusters for them to brood underneath so that it simulates that they are actually being brooded by something. Um, and then the picture on the right is uh, just a weight being taken and then a band being put on a newly hatched chick. We do, we do have to band the newly hatched chicks with temporary bands. Um, they, this is because we sometimes can have two or three clutches hatching at the same time. We want to keep the chicks together. Um, we want to um, make sure that they're in the right clutch and that we can follow them and keep track of them. So it's important to identify them and, um, while they're being reared. Next, please. Eggs can weigh um, between 9 to 12 grams uh, by the time the egg is hatching. It is, um, they can be six to eight grams. Um, we do band them in the first 40 out, 48 hours and it's temporary until they get their permanent bands on from a uh, field crew. And then our goal is to feed them, keep them warm, teach them how to forage outside and make sure that they start to develop thermal regulation skills. Um, they do get up and start running around when they're a few hours old and they start eating. So because they don't have parents, um, they need to spend some, some time sitting underneath a feather duster or um, stuffed animal so that they can um, 
sorry, I was looking at a question, so that they can um, retain their metabolism and not burn their metabolism if they're trying if they're cold and trying to stay warm. Um, we try to get the birds outside as soon as we can. Um, depends on the weather. Um, and if it's a nice sunny day and they're young chicks, we might put them out for a few hours in the direct sun. And as they get older, they spend more and more time outside. And uh, sometimes we have clutches with different ages. So you can see on the bottom right that we have, we have a, the lake foraging pen, and then we have a big pool inside of it, and we have a little pool, and that's so we can keep the different aged chicks separated. Next, please. They, they start eating right away. So our, um, we're very busy with newly hatched chicks because they are fed by zookeepers from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, we go in there every two to three hours and stagger it a little bit. Um, as they get older, they are fed less. They're spending more time outside foraging on their own. And so as, as they age, we uh, back off on the amount of feeds that we do and the time in between them. They eat a variety of insects, uh, blackworms, crickets, mealworms, waxworms. Um, sometimes the staff can, can catch uh, local insects and feed them. Um, we have been successful chopping up egg white and feeding it to newborn chicks that are having a hard time picking up the eating skill. And um, I think it resembles a lot of ant um, eggs that I've seen them eating out in the wild, that they're white. They seem to be really attracted to that. Um, but we do keep track and we weigh the chicks every day. It's extremely important to make sure that they're growing on the, and that they're not growing too fast. So in the lower left corner, you can see this is where we house the chicks when they're, um, after they've hatched within a couple of days. And we keep them in a private area. Uh, we use shower curtains. We are quiet. Um, we provide sand, heat, night lights feather dusters, everything that they need. We toss food and scatter it around to teach them to forage for themselves. And we also play uh, a lake shore um, sounds in the background to make them feel like they're at a lake. And then additionally, when we handle them, we will play alarm calls to make sure that they're getting a signal that we are, um, when we're handling them, that they should fear people. Next, please. Again, we have two types of overnight pens. We have the lakeshore pen, um, which they spend the daytime at, and they can bathe, they can forage, they can thermoregulate. It's got some weeds in it. If they wanna go back and kind of hide like adults would, they can hang out in the weeds. Um, when they're old enough, the pen on the left that is attached to the building is a predator-proof pen. So what we do is as they get older, they also need to learn to spend um, time outside in the dark and what it's like to hear noises in the dark and what have you. So they spend the night in this outdoor pen. Next, please. The fledgling occurs between 25 and 30 days, depending on their weights. Um, but we definitely start to see them take short flights in the outside pen and they um, become harder and harder to catch. We know that they have uh, good flight skills. The chicks are banded and they, they do, uh, piping plovers do have a lot of bling and all of the bling means something to everybody. Uh, the captive reared chicks get a special type of band that lets us know as it follows um, these birds through their adult life that they have been captive reared. And then the chicks are taken to an area um, nearby and um, released with chicks of the similar age that are wild chicks in the hopes that they, um, they do actually hang out together a little bit and travel together. Um, I have to say that we spent an enormous, Francie's crew and my staff have spent an enormous amount of hours on the road providing an Uber service for pipe and plovers the last two years. We will also be doing it this year, but it's important that we do this and um, do everything that we can to keep this program going and um, watch it become super successful. Um, I don't know if there's a next slide, there should be. So this is just kind of a summary of what has happened from 2002 up to 2021. Last year, we had 13 captive rear chicks. 
Uh, the year before, during the pandemic, we had 39. That's, that's an odd amount with the weather in, out in the field and water levels were really bad that year. And so the grand total for over the years is 312 captive reared chicks that have been introduced to the population. And I think that is my last slide. And here is my um, contact information. Anybody needs to contact me. And thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, hi, everyone. It, this is Erin again. Um, before I start chatting with you about calls to action and how you can get involved, I did want to remind you all that we are a little over um, time. So if you need to leave now, uh, you can. We will be sharing out the recording uh, with all registrants at the end of this webinar uh, in a follow-up email. So you can keep your eyes and ears peeled and uh, watch the rest of the presentation then. Um, but if you are able to stay on, we'll finish the, the presentation and do a little bit of Q&A if time allows. And we have enough folks hanging around. Um, in the meantime, thanks to Vince and Sarah for answering uh, some questions in the chat. All right, so how can you get involved and help our piping plovers here in the Great Lakes? And there are a few different ways. The first is to share the shore. Uh, you can do this while you're on vacation or out on the, the Great Lakes shoreline, um, being aware of the presence of any nesting birds, um, piping plovers or other shorebirds. Um, you want to make sure you give nesting birds at least 100 feet of distance, uh, especially if space allows. And if pets are permitted on beaches, it's really important to keep them leashed. Um, I know they can really enjoy uh, the fun of freedom, um, but it can really impact nesting birds, uh, causing adults to, to flush, uh, causing increased stress and potentially putting uh, stress and pressures on the chicks themselves or, or eggs um, in the nest. It's also really important to remove trash um, from the beach if you do go out and have a picnic, uh, as this could attract some of those predators that uh, Sarah and Vince mentioned, like crows and gulls, um, and they could then find and eat some of those eggs and chicks. And you also wanna make sure you don't actually go out driving on some of these dunes um, or other nesting areas. Uh, Piping Clover Awareness in Traverse City is the, is the project that Sarah mentioned. Um, so Audubon is launching this new uh, outreach and engagement program, a pilot program around piping clovers in the Traverse City area. Um, and that'll be starting this summer and right by Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. Uh, so we should be dropping a link in the chat as well as in the follow-up email uh, to a sign-up form for those who might be interested in getting involved. Uh, you can become a volunteer uh, as part of this project as a steward to help support piping clover outreach, um, but also monitoring efforts. And a reminder too that Traverse City is a major tourist destination, so if you're planning on traveling to Traverse City, um, or if you spend a bulk of a season in Traverse City, uh, you can also participate in this program and learn more about it. Um, we also wanted to mention that this does draw families from across the Great Lakes region as well. So again, if you plan on traveling to the area, um, you could still get involved in this project. Uh, additional opportunities to get involved. Uh, we encourage you all to support local conservation organizations that are supporting uh, this project and the recovery effort. Um, that long list of partners that we shared earlier uh, are all involved in the recovery effort. And then also to like and follow the Great Lakes Piping Clover Recovery Effort page. Uh, they post information there regularly on our Great Lakes piping plovers and any observations uh, people have been making while they're on their wintering grounds or during migration or when they return back to Michigan and the Great Lakes region. And with that, I will pass things over to Emily to see if we can answer a couple of questions, but we understand if we uh, choose to wrap things up. I think we have time for some questions. Uh, thanks, Erin. Thanks everyone so much for joining us. Um, and thanks to all our panelists too for such uh, great information. So much information was shared today um, and we received so many really great questions. Uh, we'll have time for uh, a handful of them. 
uh, as we wrap up the webinar. Thanks for hanging out with us if you're able. The first one I want to uh, send over to Sarah. So we got quite a few questions on Merlin. So I know Vince answered this in the chat, but what is, I think is worth uh, repeating, what is a Merlin and how do you reduce Merlin predation? Yeah, Merlins are raptors um, and they're one of the main avian predators for piping flippers in the Great Lakes region. Um, so and of predominantly adults, but they'll go after fledged chicks as well. And so it's kind of a double whammy um, that they will go after chicks and adults. Um, and in terms of, of their control, um, we're evaluating a lot of different strategies for controlling Merlins. Um, and there are certain sites in the Great Lakes region um, where we're testing this out. Um, at Sleeping Bear Dunes, where Vince is at, uh, specifically North Manitou Island, which is one of the major nesting locations. Um, we do control of Merlins um, and remove them from the site. And that has dramatically increased fledging success for piping plovers on North Manitou. Um, we also are trying a variety of um, methods like falconry. Um, people like to use Merlins in falconry. And so we'll kind of have an emergency response if a Merlin is being problematic at a site and bring somebody to take um, the Merlin out. So they can have a dramatic influence um, on nesting locations, even if they take out one or two adults. You know, that's two nests and um, that have to be taken into captive rearing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Uh, this one's for Vince. So we had some questions on piping plover's plumage. Um, so how does the piping plover change from its breeding plumage to non-breeding? So do the feathers fall out and regrow? And then the second part of the question is do females also change to breeding colors? Yes, so piping plovers uh, go through a mole both in the uh, kind of late summer, early fall when they, uh, the, they actually, they do a complete moth. So they lo eventually lose all their feathers and regrow them. But the uh, breeding plumage falls out uh, and is replaced by fresh non-breeding plumage. And then in, they do it again in the spring before they migrate to the Great Lakes. And that's when the old feathers that are in the non-breeding plumage fall out and then they regrow the uh, feathers and they come in as the breeding plumage with the, the black and, and everything. Uh, and yes, females also do this. Um, and piping plovers are actually slightly sexually dimorphic. Uh, so the male, you can often tell the males from the females just based off of plumage. The males will have a thicker, fuller uh, ne neck band and forehead band. Um, and almost always the black in the males comes down and touches the eye. And there's usually a white gap uh, for the females. And also the orange on the bill of the males will usually be brighter. And there'll be a very distinct line between the black and the orange on the bill. Whereas the black on the females usually comes up a lot farther and is not as even. Thanks, Ben. Uh, this one's for Bonnie. So can you elaborate on what it means to candle an egg? Sure. Um, in that slide, I showed a picture. Basically, it's an intense um, LED light in a machine where you can um, control the degree and brightness of the light. You go in a dark room, you take the egg and put it up to um, the candler and you can, it shines a light inside and it allows you to see um, cracks, embryo development, heartbeats, um, chicks, hatching chicks when they're hatching. So basically it's kind of just a, um, a way to x-ray without hurting them and look inside and see what's going on. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, Sarah, uh, does banding hurt the birds? And they run so fast, the chicks, um, from the video, we saw how cute they were running really quickly. How do you catch the chicks without scattering them and mixing them with other pairs? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, no, banding does not hurt the birds. Uh, it's like putting on a bracelet for yourself. Um, so, and the bands are big enough so that they allow 
growth from trick to adult. Um, the only thing that bothers them is they kind of go off and clean themselves after we ban them just because they want to get a bath afterwards. Um, and then the chicks, yes, they do run really fast. And so we generally have at least four people, sometimes six people or, or more helping surround them. So we like to kind of start far back off in the dunes and kind of drive the chicks towards the lake, towards whatever water body is nearby. Um, and then we slowly close in and we have these really soft um, nets. You'll probably, if you see a video um, of these little handled nets, that we carry, they're really soft and we just pop them on top of the chicks when we get close enough. Um, so we can ban all four of them together and then release them together. Um, so some places like North Manitou where we have a lot of nesting pairs and chicks could potentially get confused with other, with other broods. Um, we try and kind of separate that off with another human being kind of blocking off the other brood and then slowly pushing them away from other ones so we can kind of ban them in groups of siblings. Awesome. Um, as our last question, I'm going to open it up to all the panelists. We got quite a few questions about migration of the piping plovers. So this might be a little bit of a mouthful, but um, for migration, do the birds fly at night during migration? Do they stop for food and water when they're migrating? And do they require freshwater beaches or can they survive on saltwater beaches? Uh, so I can start that off and uh... The big answer to this question is migration is a bit of a mystery that we're still working on. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Francie Cuthbert um, is looking into some potential research to attach transmitters to a handful of birds, which should give us some more information on that. Uh, but I will say we do know they will migrate at night. Uh, it may, they may even primarily migrate at night. Uh, we believe that they are capable of flying the entire distance between the Great Lakes to the uh, Atlantic or Gulf Coast in one go, but we do know that they do sometimes stop. Uh, we don't have a lot of information on that. Uh, sightings away from the Great Lakes or the, the ocean coasts are quite rare, but they will use a variety of uh, wetland habitats when they do that, including just like farmers fields that are flooded or uh, sometimes major migration points like Horicon Marsh in Wisconsin. Um, and yes, they, they definitely can survive on salt water. They, they live on salt water all winter long. Awesome, I think you covered it then. Um, so I'm gonna pass things back over to Erin. She's gonna wrap up the webinar and she's gonna let everyone know how you can best stay in touch with us. Thanks, Emily, and thanks so much again, everybody. Um, if you would like to stay in touch with Audubon Great Lakes, MI Birds, uh, National Park Service, and Detroit Zoo, you can visit our websites or follow us on social media. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, also, please stay tuned for the follow-up email I mentioned in the coming days that'll have a link to our webinar feedback form and a recording of this webinar. Um, also, if you're interested in participating in a future webinar or event, you can visit audubon.org forward slash events. Um, thanks so much again, everyone, and hope you have a great weekend.